by impress law, we're talking about moral law. We're talking about something that has always been in effect. And, and you understand this, right? Has it always been wrong to murder? Did God have to specifically say it was wrong to murder for it to be wrong? No, it's always been wrong. It's an, it's an inherent thing, right? We, we know that it's a perpetual concept and it was always wrong. There was no uh, actual written law that we know of in Genesis 4 when Cain slew Abel. But Abel knew good and well he had done wrong and that he had actually forfeited his life because he was going to be looking behind his shoulder for somebody to come and, and revenge, right? He, he knew that. He understood this concept. So when we're talking about impress law, we're saying that God has given a moral law and this moral law has always been in effect and will always be in effect. Mm -hmm. This moral law, <clears throat> excuse me, this moral law, I got something in my throat there, excuse me. This moral law <clears throat> was not given in order to make it right. God gave the moral law because it is inherently right. Right? So just, you understand morality. Has it always been wrong to, to murder has it always been wrong to commit adultery? Yes, right? We know we're not supposed to do certain things. We're supposed to act a certain way. So that's impress law. <clears throat> now, express law is simply that which God revealed. So when we're talking about moral law, we're talking about something that's inherent, something that has always been in effect, something that God gave because it's right. When we're talking about express law, we're getting now more to the realm of God commanding man to do certain things for certain reasons. Now, we've understood this, and we want to make a point uh, to emphasize this. And again, uh, this lesson did not originate with me. Um, I, I got the idea from Brother Jerry Brewer, who I'm sure got it from other folks before him, and, and I've made references uh, to that, but I, uh, this idea is nothing new. When we preach Bible topics, we're not teaching anything new. We're teaching what good brethren have taught for a long time, and we're continuing to teach the truth in that regard. <clears throat> but uh, we made a reference uh, last week, I believe it was, and we'll make that reference again, that uh, I believe it was Brother Benjamin Franklin who had written a book, and in his book, and we're talking about Benjamin Franklin, we're not talking about the inventor, we're talking about the gospel preacher um, who, who was along the same times, about the same times as Alexander Campbell and some of these restoration guys, right? We're talking about him. And in a book that he had written, he had talked about that express law is a higher kind of law than moral law. And the reason why express law or positive law is, is a higher law than moral or impress law <clears throat> is because express law has the power to make something right that isn't inherently right, right? So it is something that has the power to make something that is common right, right? That's the difference in this. And we're gonna look at some of these uh, examples as we finish up today. We know that, uh, uh, let me see, I don't wanna go into that detail. We know that moral law has never changed. We already talked about that. We understand that the law of Moses was given. As we go through this quick review, this is just covering kind of what the outline has said. We know the reference to Romans 7 and verse 13. The law was given to make man a more acutely aware of his frailty. I was reading this morning, Brother Camp in his book on the Holy Spirit was talking about that the more the man under the more that a man understood the law, the more he understood how in trouble he was. And he didn't use those exact words, but that conveys the meaning. Because a man that really understood the law understood that he's in big trouble if he has to keep this law. Right? He understands that I've got to rely on something greater, better than me, and that's God. So the people that actually understood the law are the, those individuals who understood that I, I'll never be able to keep this myself. I'll just trust in God and do what he said to do and believe that he's going to take care of things like he said. That's the way, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. But there were others who, who misunderstood this and they looked at the law as the end itself. Was the law the end or the means to the end? They looked at the law just like sometimes we, we talk about not seeing the forest for the trees, right? You, you see uh, uh, God, you see that in the Ark of the Covenant, for instance. Sometimes the nation of Israel looked at the Ark of the Covenant as God himself and not a representation of God. Sometimes they might look at the law as being God itself and not a, a, a revelation from God a means by which to uh, uh, learn from or benefit from what God has given. Sometimes they miss these things. So you have the same thing here. The law was given that, the, that sin might become exceeding sinful. That is, that man might become more acutely aware of his frailty and his need for God. That's why the law was given. We said that express law is purely revelatory in nature. That is, express law is always revealed by God to man it is not moral principles, right? It's different than that. 
We said that express law is the basis of faith. And last week we spent a little bit of time in 2 Kings 5. And we talked about Naaman. The instructions given to Naaman are an example of express law. Because God revealed them to Naaman in order for him to benefit from uh, being cured from leprosy, right? And we talked about that in that account. Did the Jordan River have any element in and of itself that was uh, a cure of leprosy? No. Did the number seven have anything in and of itself that was uh, had some kind of cleansing qualities? No, not at all. Was there anything moral or immoral about washing or not washing in the Jordan? No. So if Naaman was to obey God in this, he was going to obey a positive or an express law, and he would demonstrate his trust in God and that is an even higher form, right, than just moral, moral principles. All right. We said impress law was given because it is right, moral law, that is, and express law is right because it's given. Now, I want to look at some examples of, of express law. If you will, go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2 with me. <clears throat> Question. Question. Was there a moral principle involved in eating the fruit? Is it wrong to eat fruit inherently? Yes or no? No. Is it right to eat fruit necessarily? No. Totally optional. Right? It's up to you. So in Genesis 2, in verse 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded man, and saying, uh, Of every tree of the garden mayest thou freely eat, but or except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, when God says you can eat of everything you want to except this one, that's law. He revealed there's nothing inherently wrong with this tree. There's nothing inherently wrong with fruit or whatever the case may be. But I'm telling you, you can't eat of this. When he expressed that to man, he expected man to obey. And in order for man to obey, he had to what? Do what God said, right? That's the idea of express law. It was given to them. Chapter 6 and verse 13 and 14 of Genesis, you can see also. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now it's interesting in that last phrase, as I was trying, I'm still putting that lesson together, by the way. Um, it's, it's hard to get all this stuff together. But in that last phrase of Genesis 6 and verse 13, I will destroy them with the earth. Does that mean he's going to destroy them along with the earth or destroy them by the earth? Interesting. Because the earth would destroy him. Verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms thou shalt make in the ark. And thou shalt pitch it within and without. And he goes on in more detail. Question. Is making an ark a moral principle? Yes or no? No. Well why was Moses. Or excuse me. Why was Noah obligated to make it? Because God told him. Make this. And I'm going to spare you from the calamity that I bring upon all creation. Right? That's an express law. God gave it. And it, had the, it has the ability to making uh, this command right that wasn't right inherently, right? No big deal. You can build a boat if you want to, right? It doesn't matter. But when God says build a boat because I'm going to destroy the world, you do what God says because you trust him. That expresses the highest level of faith in man. And the highest level of faith in man is what God always requires, by the way. Right? What about John 9? John chapter 9. <clears throat> we've got several examples in the New Testament of these kind of things also Jesus would give specific express commands and if man was going to benefit from those commands he would simply trust Jesus and do what he says right well in John chapter 9 there's a man that was born blind if you recall and in verse 6 it says, And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, that's Jesus, and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. So Jesus sees this blind man, and Jesus sees an opportunity to, to confirm that he is who he claims to be, that is the Son of God, and that he is to be listened to. And he is come from God, John 10, 25. The works would bear witness of this. And he sees this opportunity and he tells this blind man, all right, if you want to have your sight restored, then you go over there and you wash in the pool of Siloam because I've made this clay on your eyes. Now, again, a question is washing in the, in the, the pool of Siloam a moral obligation? No, it's, it's not. What about anointing eyes with clay? No, we understand, right? I, I, I'm sure you understand by now what we're talking about. But because Jesus said, go do it, the blessing would be offered if he what? Did it. 
if he did it, right? So when the blind man was, said, was told to go wash in the pool of Siloam, how do we know that he believed Jesus? Verse 7, that last clause says, He went his way, therefore, and washed. So you're telling me that he went to the pool of Siloam just as Jesus instructed? Yep. Was he recipient of the blessing before he went or after he went and did what Jesus said? Same thing. Remember Naaman? Same exact thing. Exactly the same principle here. All right, with this idea in mind, I'm going to read you a verse. <clears throat> then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. What did Jesus say? What does inspiration say? Well, inspiration says I need to repent. And inspiration says, and I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins, in order to obtain remission of sins. And these things are done by the authority of Jesus. Now, if you believe what Jesus said, what are you going to do? You'll repent and you'll be baptized for the remission of your sins, won't you? Because he said do it. What's the difference? What is the difference in John 9 and Acts 2.38? Isn't it, isn't it requesting an, an act of obedient faith on the, on the behalf of man? You know, in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, Peter would say, The light figure wherein to also baptism does now save us, right? Not the removal of the filth from the flesh, but an answer. That word answer means request. It's actually a request. A request of a clean conscience by the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> Peter would say in Acts 2 and verse 21, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, quoting Joel 2 and verse 32. When we call upon the name of the Lord, we are invoking, we are requesting salvation from Him. And the only way you do so is by doing what He said to do. So if the blind man was said to call upon the name of the Lord, if we use that same principle, how could he have called upon the name of the Lord? By going to the pool and washing. Why? Because that's what Jesus said to do. In 2 Kings 5, if you could say that Naaman called on the name of the Lord, how would he call on the name of the Lord? By going to the Jordan River and washing seven times because that's what the Lord said to do. All right? We're getting it, aren't we? Pretty easy. <coughs> Pretty simple as we're talking about this. So it's the same thing in Acts 2.21, call on the name of the Lord. Peter would tell them how to do so in 17 verses, and he does right here in Acts 2 and verse 38. How can they call on the name of the Lord? They could repent. And they can be immersed or baptized for the remission of their sins. <clears throat> What's the result? Well, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And these individuals were offered the remission of their sins by gospel obedience. The same idea, okay? Now the point being here is as we go back to the purpose of the lesson is we understand that gospel obedience is not a moral principle. Gospel obedience is an express law given. And if man wants to be saved from his sins... He'll do what Jesus says. Is being baptized a moral principle? No. But it is an express command of God, right? And if we are going to obey it, we're going to trust in God and do it the way he said to do it. Now again, we can spend a little time here for just a second. We have to understand that just any old baptism isn't scriptural baptism, right? What if you said that I was, uh, as an infant, somebody splashed water on me in a ceremony in a church building? I was baptized then. No, you weren't. Right? Romans 6, 3 and uh, through 5 says that baptism is a burial. We understand it's a burial. We're buried with him by baptism into death. Romans 6, 4. It's not, it's not a sprinkling. And you know this good well. Because all of the dead folks that we have that, that, that are uh, on the earth, all the dead folks, where are they? Generally speaking, they're buried. You didn't just throw them off on, in your yard and sprinkle a little spoonful of sand on them, did you? You dug a hole and you put them in it. Well, that's kind of the same thing, right? It's, a, it's an immersion. It's a burial. So we understand that baptism is a burial. <clears throat> we understand that baptism is by the authority of Christ. Acts 19 is an example of people being immersed, that is buried in baptism. They were baptized for the right reason, the remission of sins, and yet it was still an invalid baptism because they were taught wrong information. They were taught that Jesus had still to come. He had yet to come. And when he came, they would look to him and they didn't realize that uh, Jesus had already come and instituted his new covenant. Therefore, it's by the authority of Christ or uh, uh, in his name, right? That's the idea. And in baptism is for the remission of sins. Well, I was baptized as an outward sign of inward grace. I was baptized as a public confession of faith. That's not in the Bible. <clears throat> you know what the Bible says about a public confession of faith? It says confession is made with the mouth, Romans 10 and verse 10. We confess orally 
Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I do. That is the confession. That is the confession made. It's made with the mouth, not in a symbol, not in baptism. Baptism is literally for the remission of sins. It is in order to obtain the remission of sins. I'm going to ask you a quick question, and I can see if you want to, you can do this or that. that that's totally fine. But Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, listen, for the remission of sins. All right? Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. If Acts 2.38 means we repent and are baptized because our sins have already been forgiven, then Jesus shed his blood because sins were already forgiven. If not, why not? It's not right, is it? Jesus shed his blood in order for man to obtain remission of sins. We repent and are baptized in order to obtain remission of sins. Well, why do we have to be baptized? Because God said so. This is getting to the crux of the matter. Will you do what God told you to do even though maybe to you it doesn't make sense? Will you demonstrate absolute trust and faith in God by doing what He said to do the way He said to do it and for the reason He gave even though maybe in your infinite mind you don't grasp this concept? You reckon Naaman really understood? He, he told you he didn't. Why in the world do I have to go to the Jordan River? I don't want to go to that mud hole. What about the abandoned far far in Damascus? I'd rather go there and wash. Why can't I go there and wash and be cured of my leprosy? What an arrogant attitude. Now think about the same thing with our denominational friend. Baptized. Oh, I don't want to be baptized. I don't want to be baptized for the mission of sins. That can't have anything to do with it. That doesn't make any sense. Well, nobody said it had to make sense to you. But if you believe God, you do what God said. Remember that example we used in Bible study this morning, Numbers chapter 20? If Moses would have been faithful, if Moses would have really believed God, what would he have done? He would have spoke to the rock. But in his anger and his aggravation, and rightfully so, what did he do? He struck the rock instead. God said, because you did not believe me. Pretty powerful. What about this? Luke 17. <clears throat> Luke chapter 17, there were 10 lepers. All right, and Jesus sees these lepers. They come to him and they, they appeal for mercy. In verse 12, it says, And he entered into a certain village. There met him 10 lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, wait a minute. Naaman was cleansed in leprosy in the Old Testament in 2 Kings 5 by washing in the Jordan River seven times. You mean to tell me that that's not the actual prescription for uh, removal of leprosy? No, it, it wasn't. It was the prescription for Naaman because God said so. But there's a different prescription for these individuals. Well, what is that? Go show yourself to the priest and give them the offering that Moses required. And it says, as they went. How do we know they believed him? Well, as they went. They did what he said. Anything moral? Involved here? No, no, no. Something expressly stated, right? We'll keep going. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down at, on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Wasn't even an, an, an Israelite. A Samaritan. One of those dogs. Right? That's how they felt about him. And Jesus answering and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto them, Arise, go thy way. Listen to this. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, when Jesus says something, should we pay attention? We say that all the time, don't we? If an inspired man makes application of an Old Testament word, phrase, or, or, or scripture to a specific event, we should pay attention. What about this? When Jesus says that when I told you to go do something, you went and did it, that's faith. That's what he said. He says, go and show thyself. And as they went, they were cleansed. And he says, thy faith has saved thee. Sometimes we overlook little, little details like that, don't we? In our reading. That's like in Matthew chapter 12. You want to know what repentance is? Read Matthew 12, 40 and 41 and go back to Jonah 3. Jesus says, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. If you want to know what repentance is, go look. All you got to do is read five verses. 
Jonah 3, 5 through 10. And he'll tell you that they proclaimed a fast. The king says, nobody eat anything or drink anything. And he says, everybody turn from your violence in your hands and maybe God will spare us. And it says in verse 10, God saw their works. They changed their mind to such a degree their entire attitude and actions changed. That's repentance. And there's not a human being on earth that can refute it. You know why? Because Jesus is the one that said it. Moral law does not test man's relationship with God. Now, I'll make sure I'm clear on this. I'm not saying that a man doesn't have to be moral. He does. We have to be moral because being moral is inherently right, right? It's, it's perpetually right. I must do right and I should not do immoral things. That's obvious. But morality in and of itself isn't enough to save you. That's where we have a lot of our friends and loved ones and relatives who don't understand the conundrum here. Do y'all remember what we just observed right here? Why did we observe it and why did it have to happen? Because I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. If morality was enough to save you, Jesus didn't need to die. Must we be moral? Yes. But morality in and of itself will not save you. That's why our friends that we know that are, they are good moral people, they wouldn't steal from you, would they? They wouldn't commit murder. You know good and well they wouldn't. But they're not uh, members of the body of Christ. They've never obeyed the gospel. They've never had their sins forgiven. Is a good moral person going to heaven or are the forgiven going to heaven? Is there a difference? Yes. While being forgiven includes in, implicitly that I must be moral, being moral in and of itself isn't enough. I need the blood of Jesus. That's an emphatic declaration of the New Testament. That's also an emphatic declaration of the Old Testament. And that's the reason the Levitical priesthood was given. So that man would understand, I'm not good enough. So we must be moral. But moral law doesn't test man's relationship with God. Express law does. Go wash. That tests whether you're paying attention, whether you believe me. Go build an ark. That, that really test whether you believe me. Abraham, I'm going to show you this land, but I'm not going to let you go in there yet. Get out of your country. Go in a place that I'll show you. You don't even know where you're going. Are you going to believe me or not, Abraham? Yes, sir, I'll go. That's the test, isn't it? That is what really tests man. That tests man more than, hey, this is inherently right or wrong. You know good well you shouldn't do that. But what about these other things that maybe don't make sense to me? Am I going to do it anyway because God said do it? All right, we're going to go through some some rapid fire stuff here. Was it express law or moral law that obligated the blood on the doorpost and the lentils in Exodus 12? Was there a moral principle that said you must put blood from a, a year old lamb on your doorpost and lentils in Egypt? Yes or no? No. What was, the, what was the basis of that activity? God said do it. And he said if you'll do it I'll spare your firstborn. Did express law mandate the Jordan River in seven times, 2 Kings 5, or was that moral law? That was express law. Didn't express law mandate repentance and baptism for the remission of sins, Acts 2? Doesn't express law test whether man really loves God or not because faith comes by hearing God's word? Remember we were in Hebrews 11 in Bible study for just a little while uh, this morning? We, we, we finished there. We'll be back there next week. But if you want to, if you want to know what express law means, just read Hebrews 11. Because every one of them obeyed God because God said do it even if it didn't necessarily make sense to them. And the best example I think in there is in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 in the example of Abraham when he offered Isaac. And it explicitly says in that text that he knew God was going to bless him through Isaac and he knew Isaac hadn't had a child yet. So he says if I have to offer Isaac, God will just raise him from the dead. It doesn't make sense to me but I trust God can take care of it. That's it, isn't it? That's the idea. So when God says, I want you to believe in me, I want you to believe in my son whom I'm sent, John 8, 24. When God says, I want you to repent of your sins, change your mind about sin, no more of that. Come uh, turn around in obedience towards me, Acts 26, 20. When God says, I want you to acknowledge my son as Lord, 
Romans 10.10. 10. And, when, and when God says, I want you to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins because Jesus said so. And if you do it, I'll forgive you. You know what? I believe it. And that's exactly what he teaches. So if somebody asks me, how can you possibly teach that baptism is essential? I ask, how can you possibly believe it's not? Because Jesus says, when you do what I tell you to do, you'll receive the blessing I promised. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Let's look at a few similarities and differences. Both moral law and express law are of God, aren't they? They're of divine origin, certainly. Both of them are right, even though there are different reasons why they're right. Was it right for the nation of Israel at God's behest to march around Jericho seven times on the seventh day and to blast the trumpets upon their seventh uh, compassing of the city and the walls would fall? Was it right? It was right, but was it right because it was inherently right or because God said do it? That's the difference, right? Some things are right just because they're right. Some things are right because God said do it. Now here's a question. If we disobey and express law, can we expect to be blessed by God? When God tells Moses to speak to the rock and he disobeyed it, what was the consequence? Sin. If God says, I want you to obey the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, and I want you to do all that I've commanded you regarding salvation, if we say, no, I'm going to do it some other way, what are we doing? We're sinning. We're substituting self for God. We're putting self on pedestal. Now, as we mentioned, moral law cannot result in salvation for man, else Christ died in vain. And again, I, I just want to make sure I'm very, very clear on this. That does not mean that we don't have to abide in moral precepts. We do. But we don't trust in our morality to save us. We trust in God to save us. We must do right because it's right. But we're forgiven of our sins by gospel obedience. We trust in God, right? Being moral alone isn't going to save you. Romans 3 and verse 23 for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. You know, I've used this example before. What happened if you, once you became old enough, let's say, I don't know however old you were, a teenager, and you'd never done anything wrong and you chose to sin one time, and then you never sinned again. And you were so sorry for this sin that you built hospitals, and you cured cancer, and you fed the homeless, and you were a good Samaritan, and you were selfless, and you did wonderful things the rest of your life. But do you know what those wonderful things cannot do? They can't take away that one sin. That's why being moral isn't good enough. We must be faithful and obedient. Then we're forgiven. Notice also that God gave these laws. God gave these laws. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. For thy good. He gave us law, both moral and express commands. He gave them for man's benefit. Would it have benefited man to not ever eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? He'd have never known sin or shame, right? Would it have benefited man to heed the instructions of Noah while he was preparing the ark? 2 Peter chapter 2. Would it have heeded man on Pentecost to obey the gospel like the 3,000 did and they were added to the one and only church? He gives us these laws for our good. So, express law is God's test for man. In Genesis 22, as God sends Abraham into the land of Moriah to offer Isaac his son... Just as he did in Genesis 16 or Exodus 16, as he uh, is going to bring forth manna for the nation of Israel, he does this to prove them. He wants to test whether you really believe him or not. And the test of that is, will you do what I tell you to do, even if maybe it doesn't make sense to you? Obedience to express law for the simple reason that God gave it. I trust what he says. That is the highest form of faith that a man can offer.
God, you said to repent of my sins. You said to believe in your son. You said to uh, 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 turn away from sin. You told me to confess his name before witnesses that he is both Lord and Christ. And you've told me to be baptized in order for my sins to be forgiven. I believe what you said and I'll prove it. I'm going to do it right now. And I know that if I do it, I will be forgiven of every sin and trespass because you said I would. No wonder when God looks down upon such an attitude, he's well pleased. That is obedient faith. Will man love and trust God enough to do what God says for the way, uh, for the reason given and in the way prescribed? Will man respond to God's express law and the obedience of faith as God intended from the very beginning? Romans 16 and verse 26. Will man invoke the Lord's authority for salvation? Acts 2 and verse 21. Will a man trust in God and do what God says, not what man thinks? Romans 10, 8. Will you believe and be baptized that you may be saved even if it doesn't make sense to you? Mark 16, 16. I hope this has been a beneficial lesson to you and I hope you understand the difference in those two laws and I hope you understand that if we're going to demonstrate our faith in God, we've got to do what God says to do the way he said to do it and for the reason he gave without adding to or taking from. Then... We display true, trusting, loving, obedient faith to God. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here this morning that never obeyed the gospel? You must hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing God's word. Faith is based upon God said, right? What saith the scriptures, Paul would ask in the book of Romans. That's where faith comes from, from God's word. We must believe that Jesus is the son of God. John 8, verse 24. And we can do so through his inspired word. John 20, verse 31. We must repent of our sins because God obligates us to. All men everywhere need to repent, Acts 17.30. We must confess the name of Christ before witnesses that he is Lord and Christ of our lives, Romans 10.10. 10. And we must be baptized for the remission of our sins. Why? Because God said do it, Acts 2 and verse 38. For those who have obeyed the gospel, you have become a New Testament Christian. You're forgiven of all past sins. And as long as you walk in the light, we have access to the blood of Jesus, 1 John 1, 6 through 10. For those who have obeyed the gospel, but what if you stepped out of the light? What if you have uh, engaged in some unrepentant sin? Come on back. Acknowledge your sin. God will forgive you. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you. As we sing this invitation song, as we do, if any have need, the invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.